Hello, hello. We'll be starting soon. Our co-hosts at the Boston Public Library, the Leventhal Map and Education Center. Um, and we'll get started with map time. Hey, Dave. Hey, Garrett. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Good. It's nice to awesome. see you every Thursday. It's like <laughs> exactly. a little stable point in the middle of my week. Yeah. Um, likewise. Uh, so w welcome everyone to our second map time chat. I'm Dave Weimer from the Harvard Map Collection, and my co-host here is Garrett Nelson from the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we are happy to see all of you, or be seen by all of you is more accurate. Um, today we'll be talking with Catherine Parker, uh, who's the research officer at Barry Lawrence Rudderman Antique Maps, and I'll introduce her more in a little bit when she's on screen. Um, but we'll be coming to you live every Thursday at noon Eastern time and uh, for about half an hour with all sorts of uh, people that make maps, that study maps, that curate maps. Uh, and I think we yeah. have a calendar going out all the way into the summer at this point. Exactly. Right? Yeah, we have a calendar out through the end of June, uh, yep. beginning of July. So you can find that at the Harvard Library's homepage for this. Uh, so just Google map time. Harvard Library, you'll come up with uh, that page. You can also find our archive videos of every chat. So we'll be uploading these to our YouTube channel. Uh, the Harvard Map Collection has a playlist for map time chats. So the, our last week uh, chat with Ian Fowler is up there now, and this one will be up uh, probably by the end of the day tomorrow. Great, well, it's great to see so many people yeah. here. And Dave, I'll let you uh carry on. Uh, we'll right. be listening in, but uh, glad to have everybody out here and uh, looking forward to a good calendar of map time chats. Yeah, great. All right. Good to see you, Garrett. All right. I'll see talk ya. to you next week. All right. Now we're going to add Katie live from London. Hello. Hello. How are you? All right. Good. How are you? Very good. I'm glad the technology seems to work. Exactly. Um, so this is Catherine Parker, uh, who, as I said earlier, is the research officer at Barry Lawrence Rudman Antique Maps. Um, she's, among other uh, incredible service that she does, she's the administrative editor at the Hacklet Society, the treasurer of the International Society for the History of the Map, a fellow at the Royal Geographical Society, which means she gets a fancy set of letters at the end of her name. Um, and she's also working on a book, The Paper Pacific, Production and Circulation of Geographic Knowledge, 1669 to 1773. And she's published in a variety of uh, great journals, including Terra Incognitae and the British Journal for the History of Science. Um, so today, Katie will be talking to us about a map of the Philippine Islands uh, and some great stuff about George Anson and the 1748 voyage around the world. Um, so yeah, welcome, Katie. Um, do you want to start? Where do you want to start? With the map or with? Uh... Yeah, let's start with an image of the map and then I'll cue you for the other two photos. Right. I included a couple other images just so we could have a little mix up here. So yeah. this is um, a close-up view of a, of a map of the Philippine Islands that was included in a 1748 book called A Voyage Around the World, much like many other books were entitled that. But this one specifically refers to George Anson's circumnavigation of 1740 to 1744. And that voyage was a part of um, initially the War of Jenkins' Ear, which sounds a lot cooler than the war actually was. Um, and then that blows up into the War of Austrian Succession after that. And so all of Europe is at war throughout the 1740s. And somewhat surprisingly, the British decide to use their naval prowess to harass the Spanish in the Pacific itself, which they had never done before, um, except in kind of a piratical way. Uh, and so they send off this large squadron of ships headed by uh, Commodore George Anson. They take about three months to round the Cape, um, to round Cape Horn, because it's a terrible place to sail, especially when you're late in the season like they were. They lose all but uh, one of their ships. They lose uh, three quarters of their men in the whole 
process and they miss the Acapulco treasure galleon, which is kind of the whole point, which is to take the treasure galleon that is traveling between Acapulco and Manila, which you can see on this map, um, and which is kind of the backbone of the Spanish economy that's working at this time. So Anson doesn't really give up, even though three quarters of his men have died by the time he gets across the Pacific to the Philippines. He lies to the Chinese where he stops to get some supplies and says he's going to go home. And then he actually goes back to the Philippines and then is successful at taking this treasure galleon, uh, which equals several hundred million dollars. He's made a very wealthy man out of this. Uh, and they took the treasure back to the Tower of London when he returned to England in 22 uh, different wagons. So you can just imagine how much treasure was actually on this. So it was a large victory in a war that didn't have many victories for the British. And then it results in this book in which the map is featured, which is one of the best sellers of the 18th century. There's 46 editions uh, published in, I think, six languages, including Russian, in the 18th century alone. Today, there's been over 100 editions and or books about the Anson Expedition written, which is surprising because it's not actually that well known. But one of the things that's really interesting are the 42 copper plates that are included in the first, fifth, ninth, and twelfth editions of the book. And that those editions are what's called a folio edition, so they're a bit bigger um, than a normal kind of paperback book you would have today. They're about the height of a computer monitor, but definitely not the width. Um, and so they are the ones that contain these copper plate engravings. Most of these engravings are gonna be views. So they're looking at the shore um, from the, the ship itself. The centurion is the ship and kind of showing what the shoreline would have looked like to a sailor. These are very important um, to Britain at the time because they don't go to the Pacific a lot. So it actually is very informative if anyone else was to go after them. These are all drawn by Lieutenant Piercy Brett, and the originals are still um, extant today. They're in the National Maritime Museum in London. And then there are a few, three charts included as well. And this is one of those charts um, or maps you can kind of dispute whether uh, this is, this would not be hugely useful for actually sailing in the Philippines. So I'm going to call it a map. Um, and so the three charts that are included, charts or maps, is one of the entire Pacific, uh, there is this one of the Philippines, and then there is one of Cape Horn for um, Anson to explain why it took him so long to sail around it. Uh, so the one about the Philippines is especially interesting because it is not intended, like I said, for someone to sail around in the Philippines. It's not that detailed. It is um, based on a more detailed map, which is the Murillo Velarde map of the Philippines, which is probably the most famous map of the Philippines, um, which is completed in 1734 by a Jesuit. And 1744, it's actually going to be published. Um, it's going to be de-Jesuited um, because the Jesuits had gotten in trouble in the Philippines. And so the Jesuit connotations were taken out, but it, they're really good map makers, the Jesuits. And so they still include the map um, in a history of the Philippines that gets published. And that is the map that Richard William Seal who is the map maker for the Anson Expedition book, is going to use. And so it's just a very rough outline of the Philippines, but the important part, which you can see in this image, I don't know why I'm putting my finger up to show you, but I am, is the sailing passage you see through kind of the middle of the islands. And that's the passage that the Manila Galleon would take, uh, oh, sorry, the Acapulco Galleon on its way into Manila. Um, and the Acapulco Galleon, is again, it's a treasure ship. It's full of goods that are very, very wealthy. And then the Manilian galley going back will be full of silver and other important, valuable things. And so this map is more than anything, a declaration that the British can hassle the Spanish anywhere in the world, even on the other side of the world, which is what happened here. And so it's kind of a threatening um, shot across the bow, if you will. And then the whole point of this book was for Anson to editorialize about the power of the British Navy and the weakness of the Spanish around the world. So this map is very much a propaganda political item, um, but it also it tells the story of a very, very important circumnavigation that often gets forgotten. Great. And to uh, a to couple, to parse a couple things here, one of the... Um, one of the reasons the Spanish have this uh, this path is their silver mines in South America going and trading in China, which has this huge desire for uh, for for silver because they don't have a lot of access to it, and then they have a lot of goods that Europeans are not not able to make, such as porcelain. Um, 
And why I would just can you, uh, tell tell our listeners why this wouldn't be useful uh, as a as an actual navigational chart. Mm -hmm. uh, so this chart is what Matthew Edney would call a low resolution chart. Uh, it's too far zoomed out to be actually useful in terms of um, navigation. Navigational charts are usually much more um, focused on a specific part of the coastline. And here especially, the, uh, in, the bays and the inlets and things aren't labeled adequately, so a sailor couldn't use this to find his way at all. There are some decorative compass rows and room lines in, involved, but those are also just decorative. So this is very much a map that was created for a commercial audience. Richard William Seal, who made it, is actually best known for making maps for the Gentleman's Magazine. Um, and he makes a lot of them actually in the American Revolution. So he engraved a bunch of those. Um, and so, um, or on the way up to, sorry, the Seven Years' War, the American Revolution, he's dead. Apologies. Um, poor Richard William Seal. And so he's quite well known for these magazine maps, which is why I'm, I'm so interested in the, the maps in the Anson Expedition, um, the book, because it's such a best-selling book and the maps are such an important part of the narrative, which is not normal. Um, for even voyage accounts at this time, for the maps to be so important in the narrative. Anson spends pages and pages and pages explaining these maps, but also the maps kind of go on and have an afterlife and get reprinted in the various editions. And I think maps in books often get overlooked by scholars. And that's why I'm so interested in, in this map that isn't particularly valuable. It's not, um, it's not the first time that British people have mapped the Philippines, and yet I think it's a really important example of a specific type of map, which are maps in books. And it tells yeah. a good story about the Manila Galleon. Yeah, that's great. And how do you go about um, reconstructing the path of maps in books like this? Um, you know, it's, uh, it can be hard to find them, it can be hard to track down how they, how they move about. How do, you, how do you go about that process? Definitely. It sounds cooler than it is, I think, is the answer to all research-based questions. Um, so with the Anson accounts, I chose them as a case study because A, there are so many of them, uh, and B, I had unique access to some good collections that allowed me to trace all of the editions. Um, so Glinda Williams has written literally the book on the Anson expedition. It's called The Prize of All the Oceans. I have it here. <laughs> um, and it is a phenomenal book. And so he explains some of the publication of the first edition. And then he and Maria Torres Santo Domingo have written an excellent article kind of doing an initial census of all the editions that were published. So I use that as a basis and have added about five or six more that weren't on that list of just editions of the voyage. And then beyond that, I've added 50 or 60 books about Anson. So biographies mm -hmm. and things like that that sometimes also feature the maps. So basically once I had this list, it's just a list of book titles, then I would go about getting access to these books. Most of them are thankfully at the British Library, which is local to me. So I was able to call them up and then you just look through them and I made a sexy spreadsheet um, of which books had which maps. And if they were the maps, are they reduced? Are they the same? Have they um, changed or have they changed in their order that they're shown in the book? Are they a frontispiece when they weren't a frontispiece before? Things like that. And so once you have that census, you're able to notice a lot more about patterns, about prominence and which maps seem to have a longer life than others. And so really it's about counting things and making lists. Yeah. Um, the And so how do you think about the relationship between um, these different kinds of maps that get uh, included in books. So you have maps that are um, tipped into books. So they're kind of printed on sheets. And I think if I'm not mistaken from the internal evidence here, this is probably one of those. Um, yes. There are maps that are um, printed alongside text uh, or printed kind of on facing pages of text. Um, and then maps as standalone sheets. And I think Part of what you're saying is that the maps of the the go along with the Anson voyage are kind of span that gamut, and so I guess I wonder how you think about those. Um, you know, are there generic differences between those maps? Are there? Is it useful to think about them all as maps, or actually as kind of different subsets of kinds of uh, um, visual documents? That's a great question. So in the case of the Anson account, those that had 
um, the plates, the 42 plates. Where, again, that's only the first, fifth, ninth, and twelfth editions because they're folio. So they're big enough to have these 42 copper plate engravings tipped in. And of those, only three are actual charts and or maps. They're all kind of low resolution, like I said. So you wouldn't, I don't, wouldn't recommend using them for navigation. Although actually, because the Ensign account is so important for many reasons, it does get used by Cook and later navigators because there's been so few voyages to these places, which is a bit scary <laughs> that they're using maps and charts that are not of good quality, but they, that was all they had at the time. And so these maps, like I said, are tipped in. They were available to, for sale separately from the book itself. They would have been seven shillings on top of the guinea you were already paying for a first edition. So this was quite spendy. And then you would take it to a binder and he would bind it in with the binder's instructions that were also printed with the book. Um, what I've noticed in having looked at hundreds of examples of this book is that sometimes individual owners kind of misbehaved uh, or else binders weren't very good. One of the two, can't know. Um, so sometimes they're not between the pages they're supposed to be or often um, a certain chart, usually the chart, um, sometimes the chart of Cape Horn will be moved to a frontispiece because it's quite um, impressive. Uh, and so you see kind of individual choices going on in the placement of these plates. But then also I'm sure um, I have some evidence for this in that someone bound a fifth edition, they bound the entire text separately than the plates. They had a plate book mm -hmm. and then the textbook. And then I'm sure some people just bought the plates and used them mm -hmm. for decoration. Um, and so there's a lot of individual choice you're seeing going on in plates that were supposed to be tipped in. And then not in the case of this book, but other books, sometimes there were maps that were separately issued, almost as advertisements for the books themselves. And so they definitely are maps in terms of how we would classify them in an archival or a library system today. Um, but for 18th century readers, they would have been one in the same part of a visual culture that was very dependent on geography and specifically cartography for a kind of the visual imagination of this wider globe. So it actually is kind of unfortunate um, in certain libraries when the maps are so divorced from the text and the books that it's hard to know they ever actually went together unless they have a plate number or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great point. I think that, and we, we can look at um, some of these in a second, but the, uh, that there are, you know, we think about maps as one thing and images, often as images as another, but actually that there, are, um, what you're describing is that this map um, looks like a chart, but actually might have more in common in how people are using it to um, one of the drawings of seals or any of these other drawings that um, we wouldn't mm -hmm. classify as a map, but that actually are giving people a sense of where is this place? What's this place like? Definitely. Um, how can I imagine going there without actually ever uh, having to, to brave the, the Definitely. The and on that, for the other editions, which are only octavos, so they would be smaller books, um, it's, an octavo refers to an eighth of a page um, once you've printed it, so you folded it um, into eight separate sheets, or eight separate pages, excuse me. Um, the octavo didn't have the plates. There's actually a fun little, um, <laughs> an extra page put in being like, there were 42 copper plates. They don't fit in an octavo binding, so you don't get them. Um, so you only get three. Um, and the octavos came with a different world map that wasn't with the original, and then they would get the the long fold out map of the Pacific, and they would get the Cape Horn map. So this Philippines map was not included in the smaller octavo versions. So this Philippines map is actually rarer than some of the Cape Horn maps and the, the pull out Pacific map, because there mm -hmm. were only four editions that had it as opposed to 20 that didn't. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, one of the things that I uh, liked looking at it was um, the, there's also this relationship between fact and fiction that, that's at work in some of these. Like I, I think that I was looking at the uh, at one of the the editions. Um, I think that you reference in one of your articles that, um, and you have an image of of a place that's called Robinson Crusoe's Island, uh, mm. which now is, it is you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and so you know this kind of like this fictional this play between real and fictional places. I think it's interesting. Um, Definitely. Have some and, other... um, Andrew Lambert's actually written a book called Crusoe Island about okay. that. <laughs> um, the, the, um, 
yeah, why don't we take some questions? I've got some questions coming in. I encourage you to use the uh, the question button rather than the comment button to uh, submit your questions so everyone can see them. But uh, we've gotten a couple. Um, you mentioned this before, but um, what what do we know about the map makers of these particular maps? Um, you mentioned seal as one. Yeah, so the, as far as we know, there is no um, designated, well, we wouldn't say there's a designated map maker. Um, on British expeditions, it would be the duty of the commissioned officers to be making all maps and charts. And so we do know the identity of the person who did the views, which were roughly 35 of the 42 plates. And that's Lieutenant Piercy Brett, who goes on to quite a distinguished career afterwards, as do all of, um, all of Anson's lieutenants. He's a very good... Um, leader in that he makes sure all of his followers get very good um, appointments afterwards, and they're all made post-captain, all of his lieutenants are afterwards, which is quite quite a feat. Um, but thankfully, there were a lot of wars, so we could do that. Um, but then beyond that, we know that some of his lieutenants probably were helping him while, um, and Anson did some of this work, but that they were all doing sketch charts as they were going. They were all sharing instrument measurement and things like that. Um, but we don't know of any charts that were necessarily made on the voyage themselves. All the seal charts would have been done afterwards. For example, this um, Philippines map is based on one that was published in 1744. Um, so they were still at sea when it was published. So all of the seal charts, um, Richard Williams seal, not the elephant seals, um, those are going to be drawn afterwards from other sources. And Anson himself explains over the course of about 10 pages in his um, voyage account, how he compiled the Cape Horn map afterwards using Sir Edmund Halley, um, uh, Alma de Frezier, and a few other sources. Mm -hmm. um, we, have a, we have a few questions from, from Julie. One of them is, uh, did Anton stop in China? And why the, uh, we might, I'll add to that a question she put in earlier, which was, um, was there a particular loot that Anton wanted, uh, whether the silver or the treasures. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so he does stop in China um, and doesn't, he doesn't like the Chinese officials. He's a Macau um, and he doesn't like them very much. Um, there's a couple articles that Glenn Williams has written um, with our uh, sources that are and now in actually the Oregon Historical Society of all places. Um, and so he has not a great experience at Macau, and he also goes to Canton, where the ship is um, actually told that they can't leave until Anson kind of uh, threatens <laughs> the officials <laughs> and reminds them that, that he has a lot of cannon on board his ship. Um, and so he is there actually twice to Canton and Macau, um, and he's only there because he needs supplies. So his men suffer terribly from scurvy when they round Cape Horn, and then they also suffer terribly from scurvy when they're going across um, the Pacific itself. That, that takes another um, few weeks and they don't have enough supplies. So when they get to what are today the Marianas, at the time were called the Ladrones, um, to Tinian Island, uh, they stay there for a bit, refuel, and then head straight to um, China because they know those ports will A, likely let them in, and B, that they will have all of the, um, the things that they need and that they'll take mm -hmm. um, Anson's credit because he would have to pay for that as the captain. Mm -hmm. Um, and another question that Julie put in earlier is um, what, who got the money from the Anson account book? Like what's, how's the breakdown of that? The, you know, how much does the crown tax get? Uh, are there? Um, um, from the, from the book or from the treasure? From the, well, from the book, but also from the treasure, I guess. Yeah, the treasure um, falls under prize law. So I think Anson gets about 10% of it himself, which was a ridiculous amount of money. And then each officer descending down to the um, lowest able seaman or the cook is going to get a small percentage and that's all defined by prize law. And then the rest will all go into crown coffers directly. So mm -hmm. it's quite lucrative, um, that expedition. Yeah. And then of the book, all of the proceeds would have gone, um, there wasn't an advance as far as I know for this, but all of the proceeds would have gone to um, the authors, which in this case is Richard Walters, who was the chaplain on the voyage. He's the official author. He's also helped by Benjamin Robbins, who's a fellow of the Royal Society and a military engineer who dies quite tragically in India. Um, and then Anson himself would get a large cut. And obviously the publishers, the Napton brothers, who specialize in these voyage accounts would. The Crown itself wouldn't get anything, or the Navy would not get anything out of the book. 
That said, mm -hmm. this is the first authorized Voyage account in that um, Anson is the leader of the commissioners of the Admiralty at this time. So he's effectively running the Navy. And so because of his position, this, this is usually called the first official account and is therefore directly tied to the more formalized accounts that are actually commissioned by the Admiralty um, in, when we get to the 1760s with Cook and Byron and, and Carteret and those guys. The other Byron, not the... Yes, <laughs> uh, it is Lord Byron, the poet's grandfather called Foulweather hmm. Zack. Um, let me, before we get too far away, I wanna make sure everyone sees the elephant seals. Oh, please uh, do, the elephant seals which are are One of the uh, copper plates tipped in, is that? It is, is and actually correct? this is, I wanted to include the elephant seals just as a contrast. We're used to seeing voyage accounts from the later 18th centuries that are full of pictures of flora and fauna we think of um, kangaroo and dingo from the first Cook expedition. This is actually the only natural history image we get out of all of this voyage account. And um, we get very little idea of natural history at all. Uh, Anson is very taken with breadfruit to the point where he actually has a porcelain set made while he's in China that has breadfruit on it. Um, and it's still at his house in Shugborough at the estate. Um, but these elephant seals, which the men hunt when they're off South, South America, is the only hint we get of naturalism, naturalists or botany or something like that. So that's, I just wanted to provide a contrast that this slightly earlier voyage is much more focused on geography and what we would call cartography and hydrography now than they are on botany, natural history, and some of the things we're more used to with Joseph Banks, the Forsters, mm -hmm. and those later naturalists. Yeah, interesting. Um, and one more question we have is, uh, how is this map used in South Sea, West Philippines Sea dispute between China and the Philippines? Um, mm, I'm, I'm not sure if this one has been used directly. It's a derivative map, so I don't think it would be overly helpful um, with the Paracels and things like that. But that is an extremely political topic. And I know that for a lot of our Philippines maps, people from that area, either from the China side of the dispute or the Philippine side, will often, that's the first thing they'll look for is how that area is portrayed. So even these older maps can be used for quite political purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know, we have researchers that come into our collection too, looking for those. Um, great, and how do you, so I mean, one final question I had was, how you think about these maps in, um, as kind of objects of study versus a means to historical inquiry? Like how do maps fit in your research and your thinking um, in that in that poll? You know, some people um, I think are more pulled to studying maps as maps and uh, as objects in and of themselves. And I think other people are pulled to, to them as kind of sources for larger, larger questions. I guess, how does that sit with you? Definitely. I've used, um, so the Anson account is my main case study for the larger book project, but also for some articles I've already published. And I've used the maps and charts in, in both ways. So I've written an article about specifically um, how about the Cape Horn experience, which is not a very good one. Um, <laughs> and about that map, because Anson is very clear about how he went about constructing that map, which we don't get that many memoirs that are that clear about the extent to which this map was used for this area and that um, he has a thing for Edmund Halley, even though Halley's map is wrong. And he really has some problems with pointing out that Halley was wrong while still wanting to keep Halley on a pedestal um, for being a genius. Um, and so I've written an article just about the content of that map. Whereas the larger project that I was talking about earlier about the maps in books, that's actually much more just about their, not the content themselves, but those maps within the books. So much more history of the book, much more qualitative, um, sorry, quantitative, and then doing qualitative analysis off of that. So that's less about what the maps themselves contain and the fact that they exist within the larger book object. So I think I'm, I'm interested very much in both. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I would like to see more historians interested not only in content because that's important but also where in the book is a map included if it's in a book how widely distributed that book was so the kind of those larger history of the book questions i wish that would come in 
a bit more. And I know that Carla Lois and uh, Jordana Dim are actually working on a very large Maps and Books project right now mm -hmm. that I am eagerly awaiting. Yeah, as are we all. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, if there are any other questions, you can try and slip them in under the wire. But otherwise, um, thank you so much for coming. This has been a great, a great map time chat. Um, and yeah, we look forward to, to more work and seeing you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. All right, uh, stay safe. You too, see you, bye. All right, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I'm gonna try and get rid of the seal here. Um, well, we'll trade places with the seal. The, Thank you all for coming. We will be back next week, uh, same time, 12 Eastern, with uh, Susan, uh, Susan Powell and the, some other folks from the Gorilla Cartography group uh, talking about uh, some, some maps and the kind of map making they do over there. So uh, we'll see you then and stay safe.